Welcome to a video that um, I may or may not post, just depending on how I feel about it. Um, but I just thought I should get this out as kind of a a video diary of sorts. Uh, please excuse any external noise. Uh, my cat is running around the living room. But uh, if that's the case, just bear with me. Okay. So this is going to be my story, my conversion story to Judaism. Um, uh, not everybody knows that I am a, a convert to Judaism, and uh, now that I am a full-fledged halachic Jew, um, I'm kind of creating this in order to um, explain my path, uh, help people see if it's a path that is um, similar to a path that they went down and for them to know that there's hope for if, if that's something that they decide they want to do. Um, throughout this video I'll be kind of uh, going law and order on it. I won't be using names of people that I've come in contact with um, because I'm not about if I get some kind of detail wrong I don't want to be uh, uh, running the risk of, of hurting people's reputations uh, committing Lashon Hara, which is evil speak. I want to uh, just share my story. My intent is not to uh, hurt anybody. My intent is to help people um, if this is the path they choose to take. Now, Judaism is not an evangelical or proselytizing uh, religion, um, and I'll kind of get into that here as well. Um, tr just to give you a background, um, I was r baptized from when I was born, a couple days after I was born, uh, into the Lutheran Church. I'm pretty sure that I was, uh, and that's like one of the main, you'll hear that, I'm not going to say what denomination of Lutheranism, yes, there's multiple denominations of Lutheranism, um, I'm not even going to name that, um, but I was baptized into it and raised in the Lutheran Church, and I uh, was also confirmed I, that's the process of which you confirm your baptism at around a similar age of when uh, Jewish children do bar mitzvah um, because the Lutheran church believes in baptisms when you're an infant um, mainly because there is a uh, theology about everybody needing to be baptized in order to be saved according to Christian theology um, and so they do this even to infants so that they don't run the risk of if a child is to die or something like that um, that their soul will be secured according to Christian theology um, so I was baptized in the uh, in the Lutheran Church uh, growing up I always had a, a pretty good relationship with God and actually uh, some would say that as a, from a very young age I was very uh, uh, spiritually mature for my age. Um, I remember a couple of different moments when I was about, oh, I don't know, between ages 10 and 13, I remember having a couple deep experiences of really questioning God. Uh, if there was a God, um, I, I particularly remember these moments around the time my uh, grandfather died and my uncle died. They died in the same month. Um, that was about the time I was in about sixth grade. And I remember uh, sitting on our neighbor's mailbox in the cul-de-sac where I grew up in Oklahoma. It was a rock mailbox. It was made of like bricks that are mortared together. And I remember just looking into the sky and really questioning whether or not God exists. And I, it, the idea that he didn't terrified me, but I was always questioning things. Um, I grew up in a really small town a suburb of Tulsa in uh, in Oklahoma and our church was in within well growing up I had lived in several different places before I got to this point I was born in Houston uh, then we moved to Tulsa then we moved to New Orleans then we moved back to Tulsa and then we moved to the suburb of Tulsa um, which I'm not even going to name the suburb of the Tulsa that I, I was in because um, that might let on some information as well um, so my brother and I were very close. I only have one brother um, and my parents, 
who are still together, still madly in love with each other, and are still some of my very best friends in the whole world, and I see them very frequently. And they've been very supportive of my uh, spiritual journey. Um, from the time I was very young in the church, even before I was uh, put through the uh, confirmation process, about the time you're in fifth grade, up until the time you're in seventh or eighth grade, you go through a, a every Wednesday night, you meet up with your class, um, which is people your same age that are going through Lutheran confirmation. That's in order to confirm your baptism, um, to make your faith your own, to uh, take it on as your own spiritual journey, as opposed to being baptized as a baby and not having any say in it. Um, I know there's other Christian denominations that oppose infant baptism for this reason. They think it should be someone's own thing. But um, I think the Lutheran Church and other denominations of Protestant Christianity share the idea that um, even possibly a baby who dies without uh, baptism m may not achieve salvation because they weren't baptized uh, based on different kinds of things through the, the Christian Church. So um, the pastor... Um, who is a very prestigious pastor, um, not only in our town, but nationwide of our church, who is still a great friend to me to this day. He's one of my spiritual mentors. He noticed from a very young age, um, and other, the, the elder pastor and that pastor noticed that I had some uh, qualities about me that uh, they knew that I was questioning, but they knew that I was hungry, that I was spiritually hungry, even as a as a boy um, before I even reached the age of 12 or 13 years old. And for this they even encouraged uh, my parents to uh, possibly look into the possibility of me uh, becoming a Christian minister, going to uh, Bible college and uh, seminary and things like that. I th they also had this same kind of idea um, about my older brother. So I guess they, they had uh, talked to my parents about us both becoming pastors possibly. Um, um, during this time when I was going through my confirmation, I remember um, there was some people, some born-again Christians that were coming into our church from other places, and they were kind of trying to... The, the, the church I belonged to was very, very traditional. They did everything by the book. They, had, they were one of the most um, conservative denominations of Lutheranism. Um, they had, in comparison to other uh, Christian or Lutheran denominations, women didn't do quite as much. Um, and there were other people coming into, and that was what I was raised in, that's what I was familiar with, that's what I was comfortable with. Um, say what you will about that. Um, but there was other people coming in to the church that were more born again. Uh, more, uh, they were my parents' age, but they were um, still kind of... Uh, on fire about their faith, but it wasn't immensely grounded. And I remember um, I was a musician at the time. I've always been a musician. I was a, a bass player. And I remember um, they were trying to put together like a praise and worship band. And I remember trying to, to join that because I was a talented bass player. I was a very spiritual kid. And I would have been the very youngest person in the band by far. And I remember trying to join that band. And uh, the pastor, well, they said to me, the born again Christians said, um, thanks, but no thanks. We don't feel that you're spiritually mature enough. And I remember actually the pastor being very upset that they said this. They, I don't think the pastor explicitly said this to them, but I remember he said something to my parents about um, if only they knew, you know, what kind of soul Ken is that he's a that he's a searching person. N not necessarily that he's like uh, especially learned in the Bible or anything like that. But I had a but I was a very hungry person for. God at that time. I By then I had kind of c come to grips with some of my doubts and had found real, um, I took comfort in my faith at that time. Uh, come my uh, confirmation, I took it very seriously um, to confirm my baptism. Um, but I remember whenever I had my doubts, whenever I didn't understand something about the world, about how life works, about what God wants from us, whatever um, questions I would have. I remember talking to my parents about this. We were very close, still very close. And I remember them both saying, Ken, whenever you have questions about God, what he wants for your life, um, or anything to that nature, um, go to the Bible. 
search out the Bible, read it, and see what God has to say to you through this Bible. Um, there were, I know there were people within the, the Christian church who kind of uh, taught this kind of idea that um, if you want God to speak to you, because he doesn't speak to us anymore, you know, in words, we were a very conservative Christian denomination who didn't believe God just kind of thrust words upon you or spoke to you like he do, does to prophets or anything, that you could almost crack a page of the Bible, read a page randomly, and that would pertain to your situation. I didn't really necessarily subscribe to that, but I know that God spoke to us in certain ways. Um, over the years, I uh, was always very active in my church, in the, Luth uh, the Lutheran youth group that we had there. Um, I remember I was always kind of a leader in certain things, um, but I never went out on a limb to become a leader. I didn't really want to be a leader, but um, I guess some of the leaders, the adult leaders, recognized that I had certain qualities like that. Um, still, the pastor was saying they were kind of grooming me for a seminary uh, to be some sort of a pastor or something like that. So that was from a very young age. Um, and music was a huge part of that. And I was really into uh, jazz music from a very young age. I was very into reggae music from a very young age. From about the time I was 12 or so, I was, you know, heavily into, um, not necessarily like the Rasta culture of, the Rastafarian culture of reggae, but I was um, very much into, uh, I just liked the music. I liked the way it sounded. I liked the way it jived with me. Uh, it, the biblical references within it didn't really register until some years later. Um, so I would be, uh, I was, that touched me a lot. And going through high school, I remember, uh, well, we lived in a, in, uh, a, a very small suburb of, of Tulsa. And, uh, in this very small suburb, I, I was up to my sophomore year in high school. I was still very active in my, uh, local youth group and my church. And by then I was playing music in church pretty frequently, uh, at, as a bassist, as a trumpet player, as a drummer, you name it. And uh, I was very close with the uh, the youth minister that we had brought on then. We were good friends. We were kind of, we would swap ideas. Um, I'd kind of help him out with stuff. Um, but then uh, my parents, well, at the time I was hanging out with a lot of friends that were older than me, much older than me. Um, I was kind of a, a little bit more mature for my age, so I didn't hang out with a lot of people my own grade some but not a whole lot and uh, my parents decided that they wanted to they my my mother is uh, she's very fond of the lake she always loves nature and the place that we lived was a, a suburb of a larger city but it was in the in the more plain part of Oklahoma it was very flat very boring very subdivision and she wanted something else she wanted something she was she felt like she was in a rut and I think my father shared that, but he's also willing to go along with a lot of what she wants because, um, I mean, his affection for her. So they decided to move. Um, we decided to move to another suburb of Tulsa, which is more in the wooded area um, out west near the lakes, things like that. And they were very concerned about how I would respond to this. Um, because they would have been uprooting me from my high school when I was in a sophomore in high school. Um, but I, I was on board. I was all about it. Most of my friends had already graduated, even though I was just a sophomore in high school, or they were getting ready to graduate. And also the, the school that I was in, in uh, Oklahoma, the suburb of Tulsa, didn't have any kind of jazz music program. Um, nothing at all. And I was obsessed with jazz music. I wanted to play jazz music. I was a bass player. Um, but in the school that I would be going to if we were to move, which we did, um, had a great jazz program, uh, a very smaller music program, which would have allowed me to do more things, to try out new things, because they were very limited in the people they had, so they needed people that could do a lot of stuff. So I willingly went along with it. Go, let's move. Um, happy to move. We moved the summer after my sophomore year and I started at my new school just for my last two years of high school at this new school which the school I came from was I think about a thousand per grade and I went to a new high school that was about 400 for the entire high school 
so a considerably like a 6a school to a 3a school so it was very it was, it was a big change for me the everything about it was a big change for me I started playing music in school I started doing more art in school and also in order to make new friends I, I remember there was a program um, a Christian program that would happen um, I can't remember exactly what through what Christian denomination it was or what organization it doesn't matter I wouldn't name them anyways um, but there was a uh, a weekly event uh, a, a night service um, that was especially tailored to high school kids to teenagers and I started in order to make friends I started attending that and because it was kind of it wasn't in our town and we needed to get kids there and their parents weren't going to just drive them out of town to do this I volunteered to drive a car I was driving a car at that time and I'd pack it full of people that I didn't really know and we would drive out to this uh, this service and I started going to it and making a lot of friends a lot of friends that I still have to this day and uh, it it was a very uh, loud music and it was you know a dark room with lots of stage lights and, and fog machines and very impassioned preachers who were all in their early 20s and I even though and it was very foreign to what I grew up with in the Lutheran Church we were very uh, get up early do everything from the hymnal do everything from the prayer book and don't really deviate from that um, so this was a new experience for me but I was willing to take it on partially because I needed this I didn't have any the other church I was still kind of going to at this in the other suburb but it was becoming a long drive um, so I started going to this new thing and um, the bass player was a guy I already knew from when I used to do jazz summer camps and uh, he was a good friend of mine we were both good bass players so we kind of shared that but uh, for some reason he couldn't do the service anymore and they needed a new bass player so uh, whenever the word got around that I was a, a decent bass player the worship leader who was also just in his early 20s at the time approached me who I was about 16 or 17 years old I think 17 about hey you play bass that's awesome and uh, so I joined that and that became kind of a, a little group that I was a part of and, and pretty happy with at the time around this time I started to fall back into doubts not doubts about God or even my relationship with Jesus at that time I didn't really have doubts about that um, what I had doubts was was with the Christian religion and organized Christianity um, there had been some scandals in some of the uh, music ministries that I was a part of leaders that were uh, carrying on inappropriate conver uh, not conversations relationships with some of the uh, younger particularly female parishioners things like that um, people that would act one way in the service and not another way when they would leave it was very inconsistent and that concerned me because I was all about being a godly Christian and being a Bible believing Christian I I wanted to be that way full-time it was a big deal to me um, and I wanted consistency and I wasn't getting that necessarily from some of the, the the Christian ministries I was a part of you know they would be one way on stage and then another way off stage um, so like my parents said I went to the Bible and started studying about you know what it says about that and inconsistency wasn't something I found in the slightest bit um, especially when I would study the 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 Hebrew Bible the Old Testament the Old Testament um, over time uh, I uh, befriended a bunch of people at high school and we'd put bands together and jam in garages in my parents basement and make music and just be loud and raucous and have all kinds of fun um, one of my friends that I would do that with was a kid that had moved back to town he had lived in town when he was younger but his family was from Pakistan and they were all Muslims I knew nothing about Islam or basically any faith outside of Christianity I was pretty inexperienced with I didn't understand it um, but I went with it because he was a good friend of mine and he never rubbed it in my face he never you know said you need to be a Muslim he never said anything to that nature and we were cool um, so we started playing music together and uh, the guitar player that I was playing with at that band knew that I was really big into reggae music I had been ever since I was a little kid 
um, I I was just really into the music and these two different events kind of happened between the drummer who was the Pakistani Muslim and the guitar player who was just a friend of mine who understood what kind of music I liked kind of collided at one time I mean these things and, and I don't think it's chance this was my senior year in high school and uh, I was uh, becoming less and less I was becoming kind of disenfranchised and, and not pleased with where the different Christian music ministries were going because there was a lot of hypocrisy there was a lot of uh, bad behavior that was happening not not righteous behavior of a Christian uh, or what I thought a Christian was at that time happening outside of service you know they talk one way in service and they act another way outside of service um, so I was already my foundations in organized Christianity were begin beginning to shake a bit not my faith in God or even Jesus at that time or the Bible but just in religion um, so I uh, I had that going for a little while um, and I this first event then the other event followed which kind of put me on different paths uh, one day um, I was eating lunch on the school grounds with my friends that I was in a band with, the Pakistani Muslim, the guitar player friend of mine, and a bunch of other band nerds because I was a big time band nerd. I, I played tuba, I played drums, I played trumpet, I played bass, I played whatever they'd give me um, at that time. Um, we were eating lunch, somebody, it was like hot dog day or something like that, and I remember um, somebody bringing out all the food or something, and uh, I remember my Pakistani Muslim friend hesitating whenever the food was brought and it was this is very peculiar to me and he asked well what's in that and I said well it's a hot dog and he's like is that pork and I go well I'm pretty sure it's pork I guess so what's the big deal and he said well if that's pork I can't eat it and at that time nobody none of us really knew much about Islam at all we were very unlearned and he said, and I said, well, why can't you eat pork? And he said, because my religion forbids me to do that. I can't do it. I'm not allowed. We don't believe in it. And for some reason or another, this uh, aroused something in me. Some, if I had multiple spiritual switches on the side, this flipped one of them, one, one of the breakers. And, I, and this jealousy just flooded my veins not necessarily a jealousy specifically for Islam or anything like that but a jealousy for a faith that would require anything of me I had been taught the the, the Lutheran theological idea of salvation through faith not through works this was a, a big tenet of, of Lutheran Lutheranism and whenever you tried to say that you were trying to win your salvation such as the Catholic Church and other different even Christian denominations that was seen as not biblical that would seem as, as contrary to the message of the gospel especially Paul um, but I was jealous I wanted something I wanted something to grab onto I wanted something to do every day I wanted something that was required of me and I didn't understand this and I expressed this to my friend my Muslim friend and I said, man, I wish I had a faith that required something of me. And he was very quick to say, well, I'm pretty sure that the Bible does say that you're not supposed to eat this too. Because Islam is based on, on the Bible as well. Mainly the Quran, but also it, it was, I think, inspired also by the Bible. So he, uh, and I was very challenged by this as a Christian. Somebody was challenging my knowledge of the Bible, which was abysmal at best at the time as a Christian because we just kind of believed things that were handed to us at the time especially you know if you're not in a in a in a denomination that's heavy into Bible study heavy into unguided Bible study so I set out to prove him wrong and uh, at the same time a friend of mine the other friend of mine the guitar player we would recommend music to each other back and forth all the time we would listen to the President of the United States of America, we would listen to punk rock, we'd listen to jazz, we'd listen to anything. 
and he said, I heard this one artist recently, and I think you might like him a lot. He's really good reggae. His name is Modest Yahoo. Modest what? Well, at first I thought it was a band name. I thought like, man, that's a cool band name, Modest Yahoo. Like that's a whole band. I had no idea that there was one person's name. And I remember like, okay, I'll check it out. And uh, I remember looking him up on uh, online. I think this was even before YouTube was really much around, so you had to go to some of the shared file sites and just download videos. And I downloaded a performance first that he had done on uh, the Dave Letterman show. And I just saw this guy come out with a band, um, black hat, big beard, suit with like a sweater vest or something like that. And nothing stood out about me that this is a Jew. It didn't look like a Jew to me. I didn't know what a Jew looked like. Uh, not that I think that all Jews look like that, but it didn't register as Judaism to me. And even his words didn't register with me at all because they were so fast. They were in reggae style. You know, and I just thought it was really cool. I thought he's, man, this is a really well dressed, bearded guy. And I'm intrigued by this uh, guy who's doing this. I started, as I do with a whole lot of musicians that I like, I started researching him more and found out that he was a Hasidic Jew, which I started learning what observant Judaism is, Torah Judaism. I didn't know what Torah was. I thought Torah was some kind of a foreign book, like some kind of mystical something. I remember even listening to him and not knowing what Hashem meant. I thought Hashem was some kind of uh, other deity. I th and I would even like kind of look up the lyrics to his songs and at the time I was just so into Christianity that I'm like, Hashem, well yeah, that's like God and it's like Jesus and uh, that's his God. I, I didn't even think of it as my God because I didn't know what Hashem meant. Hashem, by the way, means the name, which is uh, used by a whole lot of Judaism, the majority of Judaism, to uh, describe the four-letter name, the tetragrammaton of, of the name of the God of Israel, the Yod, He, Vav, and He, if you pronounce that or not, or whatever. But these two events kind of coincided. One, someone shaking my faith, um, and then somebody recommending something that was outside, and it was Jewish. It was very uh, uh, the idea that the Bible is is to be observed, basically that the laws of the Bible are to be observed. I didn't know what to think about this. I had no idea how to digest this. So I started to I I went back to my parents' classic advice: if you're unsure about something, read the Bible, see what the Bible has to say about it. And I was very uh, I was not satisfied with the typical Bible study that cr the Christians were pushing at that time for like the Christian programs like read the Bible in a year type of things where it says start in Genesis then go to Matthew then go to Exodus then go to Mark and the jump around and also the study Bibles with the big fat commentary on the side um, explaining away all the you know, oh, well, this is what this means, this is what that means, and not really giving you a chance to read it in context or anything like that. So I decided I'm going to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation at that time, and that was the Christian Bible, and I'm going to read it in that order, and I'm going to come to my own conclusions. Um, at this point, I was starting up my, uh, my last semester as a senior in high school, and the more I got into I at this time I was I had come from another school where it was a traditional scheduling system that means six classes a day about 45 minutes and then I came to a new school where it was four classes a day about an hour and a half and they switch off every couple months so it, it's still all the same classes but it's set up differently which was much better for me because I'm very very ADD and a longer class is better for me uh, in order to digest the information before I have to go on to the next class but because of that it made my credits off kilter and um, I had too, too many credits, but there was a rule that you couldn't just, you know, I could have probably, I had enough credits to graduate, but they said, well, that's great, but you can't just go home. You're a student here, you have to stay, you have to do something, you have to volunteer. So I was, uh, I was a, a postal person in the, like a, I worked in the mailroom at the high school. Then later I worked as a uh, 
a tutor for middle schoolers whenever they were in detention so they wouldn't get fall behind just because they're in detention. And a lot of the time I didn't have a lot to do. Maybe there wasn't anybody in detention. Maybe there wasn't anybody that needed tutoring at that time and I would sit and just read the Bible. At this time I started noticing weird things and about the Bible that I would take on. I started noticing when we started getting into the commands of God, keeping the Sabbath day holy, that was a completely foreign concept to me. I thought that was just the day you go to church. Uh, and But it really meant to not work, to, to rest, to give your, and for the entire day, to observe it, to remember God. Now at this time, that didn't mean Saturday, Friday night to Saturday or whatever, like, like Jews do. This meant, you know, Sunday. And I would defend it by saying, well, the Bible doesn't explicitly say, it doesn't say the word Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so how am I supposed to know that it means Saturday? Um, I was very unlearned at the time. I didn't realize that it did say first day, second day, third day, even though I kind of thought that the first day was Monday. Um, so there's that. And then I would read the Bible, and I started slowly doing more Torah things that I didn't know was I didn't know it was called Torah. I didn't have a Bible that said the word Torah. I had a Bible, a Christian Bible. So I started taking on things because I felt these are things that Jesus did and I want to be much more like Jesus. I started, uh, but I also noticed things about Modest Yahoo and that kind of made me think about Judaism a little bit and that kind of observance as well. I started uh, making my own tzitzit out of uh, threads that I would buy from uh, uh, like a Hobby Lobby craft store or something, and I didn't have any rhyme or reason about tying them. They were just there. Sometimes they were made out of some yarn. Sometimes they were made out of leather. Sometimes they were made out of hemp. And uh, I would wear those, and I was wearing those as a senior in high school, uh, which isn't like, doesn't make you the most popular guy in the world. And I started, uh, I read up about us, about Israel, which at that time I thought I was Israel because I was a Christian and I was, I subscribe to the replacement theology. The Christians are now Israel. Um, so, and they said you'll be a, a kingdom of priests. And I started reading up about the priesthood and the things the priests would do, and uh, the what the priests would wear. And and though I wasn't wearing priestly garments, I they said that they covered their heads when they were working in the temple. And I was thinking the whole world's a temple, and that we're all priests. And I was started wearing hats a lot. And um, this was kind of a problem in high school because you can't wear a hat in a public school. But I would make do, I would try it, whatever. My parents started noticing that I was becoming more and more uh, weird, which at that time I didn't call myself Jewish. I didn't think of myself as Jewish. I didn't think of myself as Israel outside of the Christian uh, concept of replacement theology. Um, so. I was afraid that I was going to start scaring them with my observance, especially since a lot of my things that I was taking on were very contrary to what I was raised in. Um, I began to get into the prophets after I was through the Torah. I started reading about um, in Jeremiah, like Jeremiah 10, whenever they say to basically not make trees in your home that you decorate with silver and gold with balls on them. I, I recognized that that was a Christmas tree. I noticed that a uh, it was talking about worshiping other gods, and I started worship. I started studying what those other gods might be that people worship, and I came across Ishtar, and I noticed that that was very easily Easter, so I didn't observe Easter in the typical sense anymore. And I didn't, and I noticed that uh, other pagan gods, um, most of which were born on December twenty fifth, and were born of a virgin and things like this, and they were worshipped in this way, and it was very, uh, very much like Christmas. So I, I said I'm not going to keep Christmas anymore, and that I, it wasn't that I said I'm going to quit keeping Christmas. I said I'm not going to celebrate it on December 25th because I thought that kind of made a difference. I also said that I'm not going to keep Santa Claus Christmas. I'm going to keep Nativity Story Christmas, which I thought were two different Christmases altogether. Which one was more tied to the New Testament, and one was more. Uh, tied to the legend of Krampus and, and all the other kind of uh, ideas. So slowly but surely I was starting to shed these Christian observances, these traditional Christ Christ Christian observances. 
I uh, and I remember the big thing was going to be when I ever I changed my dietary, like because I it very explicitly says don't eat uh, don't eat pork, don't eat animals with the, it has to have a, a a split hoof and chew its cud. That rules out pigs. That rules out uh, any kind of weird things that we'd be eating. Like if I had backwoods friends who were eating squirrels and stuff that they would hunt. Uh, said not to eat shellfish, uh, which was weird for me because I loved shrimp. Um, but I stopped eating those things. But I knew that if I lived with my parents at the time, I was a senior in high school, and I knew that if I told mom, hey, I'm not doing this anymore, she was going to freak out and think that, oh, I'm joining some kind of new religion outside of Christianity or something like that. And I actually had a kind of slightly deceptive way that I got away with it. Um, this was around the time that Lent was starting up, you know, the the days leading up to uh, Easter, whenever you would give up something for Lent. And I gave up pork for Lent. Yes, I know it sounds very, very funny, but that was how I felt like, oh, I, she's not gonna look, she's not gonna think twice about that. Oh, he's just giving up a food that he really likes, which was true. Um, so I gave that up for Lent and never picked it back up. <laughs> um, I did still keep the Sabbath on Sunday. I still did go to church. I kept the Sabbath on Sunday and I didn't know what the, I didn't really study in depth what the days were. So I uh, would keep it from uh, midnight to midnight, which was very inconvenient because I would start my homework for the next Monday at midnight because I thought, hey, I'm not working on the Sabbath. It was very weird. <laughs> At that time, I started getting into, I was researching more things online. I hadn't found anything about a messianic movement at all. I had found something about uh, what were called, I don't think they even have a website anymore, called the Whole Bible Christians. And I can't remember any of the names of the people that were involved in that. That was the first time I'd seen somebody wearing tzitzit that was a Christian on their the belt loops of their clothes, which I never really got around to putting them on my belt loops. I would cut holes in my undershirts and, and time on there, which my mom was thrilled about not. Um, but I just thought of myself, I didn't think of myself as a, as a Hebrew. I didn't think of myself as um, a Jew. I didn't think of myself as anything like that. Um, I was a big bearded senior in high school that wore seat seat and covered his head and kept kosher and kept the Sabbath to my understanding of it. And I called myself a weird Christian. Actually, I was still into the doctrine of the Trinity because I was still into when Jesus told his disciples, go forth and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I really had no problem with the Trinity at that time. Still. And I would call myself an Orthodox Trinitarian, which I know freaks people out. I mean, it still freaks me out when I think about it. Um, but I started looking online. At that time, Facebook hadn't really started up yet, and it was still MySpace. But I found a lot of groups on MySpace for people that were these um, uh, biblical, very highly biblical Christians that were searching out new ways and new paths. And I started, that's around the time when I started finding out about Messianic Judaism, which to me at that time didn't really have anything to do with bringing Jews to Jesus. It didn't have anything to do with that. It, ha it had more to do with bringing Torah to Christians. Um, that's what I was into. I wanted to, more Christians to get into Torah. I wanted them to be more observant, but I was also of the, I, I wasn't really a proselytizer though. I didn't tell anyone that they were wrong. All I would debate with them is that, you know, you're not keeping the Bible properly or that that's not what the Bible says because I was getting more into scriptural worship, not scriptural worship, scriptural study and the like. Um, I started going into forums and debating issues with people. Um, and over time, I finally did discover that there was a, it wasn't called Messianic Jewish, and because nobody, the, the certain movements that I was a part of, they didn't ever call themselves Jewish. They called themselves Israelites, or they're Israel, or something like that, which I'm not going to name any names of those ministries either, because I'm pretty sure they still exist. Um, but I remember coming across a, someone online who was in my town who felt the same way I did. And I met up with him. Actually, I met up with this small group it was about two or three people, and they said, would you like to come keep Sukkot at my house? And I barely knew what that was. I mean, I remember reading about the Feast of Tabernacles, but as far as Sukkot goes, it was kind of mysterious to me. 
Um, but I researched it and went to his house and uh, he had built a sukkah in his in his yard, which is I thought was the coolest thing ever. I mainly thought it was the coolest thing ever because I was coming across these people that were like me. And I thought I was the only person like that. I thought I was the weirdo in the world. I had no idea that anybody else felt the need to keep these Old Testament commandments and to shed off Christian theology that didn't line up with the Bible. I thought it was I thought I was a complete outcast. I was so excited to meet other people that shared this idea. Um, so I went and kept um, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, at his house with his wife and some other people. Uh, some were Christians that had no idea about uh, the, the Torah at all. And at that time I was starting to refer to it as the Torah. I acknowledged that it was the five books of Moses. Before then I didn't know that there was that, that was the way the Bible was structured. I didn't know there was five books, there was the law, and then there was the prophets, and then the writings. I thought it was just Bible. Um, and these people kept the Sabbath on Saturday from Friday night till Saturday, which even the Seventh-day Adventists at that time did, which I did meet some of them too, and they tried to get me into what they were doing, but I noticed that they weren't really keeping some of the other things of the Torah, so I wasn't quite interested. But it, I, would, I mean, I was interested in what they had to say, but I wasn't quite interested. I didn't really feel that they were the way that they were going on. So I started keeping that, and they said, we have this group that we're a part of. It's very large. There's lots of families, lots and lots of families that are just like us, and we would like you. You need to visit it sometime. It'll do, do you good. And I remember my first Shabbat Saturday morning that I went in, and it was completely unreal to me as a weird Christian, uh, ex-Lutheran at that time, um, walking into this room, this, it was like a, a business front. Um, it looked like it, it didn't look, it didn't even look like a church or anything like that. It, it looked like the front of a business in an industrial part of town or something. And I walked in, I noticed stars of David. I noticed that there were, there were no crosses anywhere, that there was people with wearing zizi, having big beards, that they would say Shabbat Shalom, that they would, they were wondering where I came from. And uh, it was great. I was ecstatic to meet people. It was a Torah community uh, of people who shared my beliefs. And, and I felt like I was home, like that was it. I'm cool now. I'm a Messianic Israel person. I'm a mes Messianic Israelite. This is what I am. And uh, I, I got way more in, into that community. I started making friends with the families there um, for quite a while. And uh, as I was there, that was where I, uh, at this congregation, that's where I met a, at that time I had no idea how old she was, but I was trying to live righteously and everything. Um, met the the person that I, at that time I was 19. So I was starting, I still had this interest in, in girls and stuff like that, but I had no idea of where to start because I didn't think I'd ever find a girl who would be interested in what I'm interested in. And I met a girl there who was who seemed very cool. Her, her family had been in this kind of messianic movement her whole life, so she hadn't known anything else. Her, t her Hebrew was much better than mine, and she was very modest and loved Torah and everything, and I thought this is awesome, and she was very cool. And we started kind of... Uh, we would see each other at this uh, Sabbath gathering and her parents noticed that we were interested in one another and they were very traditional. And I remember one Sabbath they cornered me and said, we've noticed that you're interested in our daughter and we know that she's interested in you. So, but we don't do dating, we don't believe in that. Um, so we wanna know if, if what, are you, what are your motivations? What are, what are your intentions? Uh, if you're, if you just want to mess around with her, that's completely off limits. Because I was still kind of a new guy there, so they didn't really know where I stood. So they go, but if you're interested in marriage, tell us. And I told them, I am. That's what I'm looking for. And I think that kind of blew their mind at the, at the time. And I, and they're like, oh, I don't. We didn't expect to hear that from him. We thought we were just gonna tell him off, and he wouldn't, you know, whatever. Um, so I belonged to that congregation for a long time. Um, everyone knew that I was kind of an item with this girl, even though she was very young, but we kept it righteous. I mean, we always had a chaperone 
even if it was just her little brother who would come along with us on if I if I was playing gigs with bands at the time which I was and I was I belonged to this community and I was a part of their family and I was going over to their house for Arab Shabbat and uh, I loved it and it was amazing um, over time as it is with a lot of Messianic congregations there there was a power struggle and I didn't really know exactly who was struggling um, but people were choosing sides um, either with one leader or another leader or one's interpretation or another person's interpretation and this happens a lot in, in messianic congregations because they can't agree on something because um, they're very uh, adamant against tradition um, but they at the same time develop traditions of non-tradition um, this is very kind of weird to me um, so it split um, this very large congregation split not in half it almost split in like fourths or fifths or I mean even beyond that it was it was it was not it was, it turned into probably five different congregations after it split and I went with the family of the the young lady I was involved with and we I just started going to their house on Shabbat that we didn't go anywhere we didn't. Go, we just studied the Torah at their, at their house, and over time, um, we started actually meeting up at uh, churches on Saturdays, since churches don't usually use their facilities on Saturdays and things like that. Um, but we were still still a community. Over time, I had actually friends of mine who were becoming interested in what I was doing. Some of them would kind of come and go. Um, and I was okay with that because I was also kind of developing this uh, idea that that Torah observance isn't for everybody um, and it was almost kind of a Jewish idea that you know some people really have this heart for Torah and that's great and they're Israel and whatever and then some people don't and that's cool they can be righteous in other ways um, at that time I befriended a fellow musician who uh, his father was really heavily into the Messianic movement and Torah and he was he's a great musician he's still a great great friend of mine and he um, he's no longer involved in Torah but for a while he was very interested in this um, partially because I was interested in it partially because his father was interested in it and I think he found there was a good medium to be in and he had been to Israel and I was viciously jealous of him um, and I remember one uh, after one gig after I had met his father before too his father had come to gigs and after one gig, he, uh, his father said to me, Hey, Ken, um, if, you, if somebody offered to pay for a trip to Israel, would you go? And I just said, well, yeah, as a Pope Catholic, of course I'd go. And he goes, well, I have a friend who chooses to remain anonymous. And it's not that I'm keeping him anonymous because I still am not sure. Goes, but he wants to pay for a, your trip to Israel. He wants you to go visit because he's heard your story and he thinks that you need to go and it's gonna it'll be really good for you and, and I was ecstatic uh, he said you can kind of go for as long as you want but I could only get like two weeks off of work it was at first it was gonna be a whole month but then it turned into about two weeks and I went to Israel that summer in 2009 and it was absolutely amazing I stayed in an apartment in Abu Tur outside of the old city um, I remember during during this trip I remember showing up uh, on my it was during my birthday in June I remember uh, praying at the hotel wearing I was very rabbinic at the time very um, even for a messianic because I was getting more into Judaism the Jewish side of it I had tefillin I'd pray with a prayer shawl which most messianic people do whenever they do pray I met lots of people there, but I didn't meet any Messianic people. I met Orthodox Jews, and I talked with Orthodox Jews. Those were the people that I befriended. They're amazing people. They, I, they were like no people I'd ever met. These people lived and breathed the Bible. The, well, the Judaism. Some of them actually didn't even know the Tanakh as well. I mean, because some. Some people do take the time to to learn Tanakh a lot, but that's not primarily what's what's 
taught in yeshivot in the Jewish schools. They, they mainly learn uh, Talmud and the, the rabbis' interpretations of different laws and the, and the Bible and things like that, um, which is cool. But uh, on this trip, I also met a uh, rabbi. He's, here's one guy that I will name, uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer, who if you don't know who he is, look him up. He's great. Uh, he is the he's basically the father of of the godfather of trying to restore Jews back to Judaism who had been missionized to by Christians um, by Jews for Jesus by Messianic people who were trying to get them to get into uh, Jesus which at that time was kind of me even though I wasn't reach I was never really reaching out to Jews um, I was reaching more out to Christians uh, trying to familiarize them with Torah um, but um, Messianic Gentiles and Messianic Jews were kind of seen as the same thing both Christians uh, in the eyes of observant Judaism which is you know somewhat true I, I still think that Messianic uh, Gentiles or um, are people that are kind of, that they have that spark and they want Torah. Um, I know a lot of them that don't reach out to Jews at all and they've, they're they adamantly against it, which I'm cool with. Um, and I met up with him and he thought I was very interesting. Uh, but also I was meeting up with other Orthodox Jews, uh, having lunch with them. And I remember several of them saying, are you sure you're not Jewish? And I'm like, yeah. I'm almost definitely sure I'm not Jewish. I'm almost sure that I'm probably more closely related to Germans during World War II that were probably fighting in the German army than I am to Jews. And they go, I, I don't, and a lot of them are like, I just don't really believe it. I think you should research it more. Uh, you seem to really have a Nanivri Neshama Jewish soul, a, a Hebrew soul. You're, you have this hunger for Torah that I've never seen or rarely see in, in Gentiles that have not just converted to Judaism. And at that time, I was very comfortable where I was, though, um, because I was still very messianic. And I, uh, the family of my, um, the family I was spending a lot of my time with, they were very adamant about we're not Jews, we're not trying to be Jews, we have no need to be Jews. Um, we are Israel. We are the twelve tribes, the ten tribes that were scattered and were coming back. Um, that was, and that's a very true thing. Uh, it is said when the Messiah comes, he will rejoin the, the it will rejoin Israel from around the world, uh, B'nai Israel. So that was easy to subscribe to at that time. Um, but that was really rough to get around when you don't really have as much of a community. Um, when it kept splintering, whenever you'd have a Jewish movement, uh, not a Jewish movement, a Messianic movement, it would splinter every time. It would disintegrate. It would one guy would fight with some other guy and not in the typical Jewish way they wouldn't uh, hug it out when they were done and agree that hey we're both Jews we're both brothers it doesn't matter if uh, you drive on Shabbat or not we're Jews nonetheless this didn't happen this was there was lots of splits in, in the Messianic movement uh, people that just didn't like each other and they had they still had all kinds of similarities but they still didn't like each other so over the years um, when I went back home, I was supercharged uh, and way more open-minded to the idea of Judaism as opposed to just um, uh, being a, an Israelite. I was more into this, I was seeing the scepter shall not depart from Judah and that there's, the, Ju the term Jewish also didn't technically just mean Judah, it meant the faith of Judea. These people were of Judea and they were Jewish by merit of their faith because you have Kohanim, Kohens, priests who will identify as Jews even though they're not of Judah because they're not of that tribe. They're of Levi. You have um, other tribes, not very many other ones, um, Benjamites, people like that of the tribe of Benjamin who will call themselves Jews. And it's not because they're of Judah, it's because they're of the faith of the people of Judea. Um, so this term Jewish, which was a three-letter word in the Jewish move in the Messianic Gentile movement, uh, became a uh, it it didn't have the sting that it used to have, and actually I felt the warmth of that community. 
I was invited to weddings. I was invited to Shabbat at Orthodox rabbis' houses. Um, these were Orthodox rabbis. There was Haredi, Haredim, ultra-Orthodox Jews sitting across the table from me during Shabbat meals in Israel. I, they were war very warm people. They accepted. Uh, they talked to me. They didn't belittle me. They asked me questions. I asked them questions. And all I knew before I went to Israel was that Jews will not accept you because you are a complete heretic and uh, they don't want anything to do with you, that they think you're scum because you're trying to missionize to them. Even if you keep Torah and even if you have a heart for Torah, I was from Oklahoma. I hadn't seen other Jews. I hadn't seen other Jews before I got to the Atlanta airport to get on a plane to Israel and uh, Chabad uh, Rebetzin or well I don't know if she's a Rebetzin she was a Chabad girl approached me and asked for a sitter and I did have a siddur or a prayer book in my bag but she the way she said it was do you got a sitter and I and I was thinking babysitter what are you talking about and I'm like a sitter a sitter she's like I need to pray I need a sitter and I go, oh yeah, I have a sitter, and I had one in my bag, and I let her borrow it uh, on the flight from, uh, I think it was from Dallas to Atlanta. And then she gave it back to me after the flight was over. And that was the very first encounter I had had with Orthodox Jews at all, or pretty much Jews at all. Um, but what I experienced in Israel was a very warm community of people that were very accepting. Um, but all I had been taught from people within the Messianic movement was that you can't talk to those people because they hate you, um, because you're not their brother, and you know. And ultimately, some people were thinking we need to save them, type of thing. They need to know. So when I got back, I had this. My eyes were kind of open to this idea of Judaism, even though I was kind of quiet about it because I knew it would kind of cause a rift, even though I had this community of, and this Messianic community, this Hebrew roots community or whatever you want to call it. Um, so when I got back, I, um, a couple of years later, got married. Um, it, was a, it was a very Jewish ceremony um, because I was living Torah. I was living as a Jew. I was living, but I wasn't calling myself a Jew. I'd never call myself a Jew uh, because that was kind of, we didn't do that in the community that we were in. We didn't think we were Jews, which was accurate. Um, but the, I always had this inkling. Uh, over the years, our community got a reputation for, well, we would have heated debates over who is Messiah? What is the idea of Messiah? What is this thing that we call Messiah? Is Yeshua the Messiah? Did he fulfill all the prophecies? And I remember my, uh, well, certain people, I won't name them, were they were they always brought this up and i remember some people going oh don't bring that up again because we've beat that dead horse we are still slamming our heads against it but it, i just I, I admired this particular man who would keep asking the question but is yeshua messiah i don't know well at first we were saying is yeshua god is he god incarnate like like christian doctrine says he is and i just in he kept asking the question and we came to this conclusion that no he can't be God and he never claimed to be God um, and because of that idea that he's not God we got the reputation in town as the messianics who had forsaken Messiah or forsaken Yeshua because we didn't believe he was God incarnate a lot of the other messianic congregations did believe that he was they they had the Christian concept of, of Jesus uh, being God incarnate, and we thought he was Torah incarnate because he said, "Then the Word was made flesh." We interpret that to hit Torah to uh, basically Yeshua being the first and last authority on Torah. Um, but over time, we kind of also had this this ongoing conversation about, well, is Yeshua Messiah? Did he fulfill things and some people were very adamant, yes he is, don't you question it, don't pull out the list of prophecies, he is, and if you don't believe it, then this isn't the place for you. 
And then other people would say, well, I'm still questioning. I remember one evening, it was Rosh Chodesh, we were trying to spot the moon. And one of the ladies at the congregation was having a conversation with me because we this was something that we were going back and forth about. And um, she said, well, Ken, do you think that Yeshua is Messiah? And my, the line that I had been toting all along was, sure. But I was getting to the point of, we'll see. Because Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, doesn't say anything about a second coming. But And there were also all kinds of prophecies that Christians and Messianics alike will say, yeah, he didn't fulfill that, but he will when he returns, when he comes again. Because then it says there will be world peace, temple will stand, um, the exiles will all be ingathered, um, and a whole host of other things that have not very, very clearly been fulfilled. And my response was, for the first time ever, I said, when she asked that question, I said, well, we'll see when he comes. And that was the first demarcation from a purely messianic thing. I still believe that he was everyone, everything he said he was, but if you do look at what um, Yeshua says about himself, it is, it's very mysterious. It's riddles. It's, who do you say I am? It's very, I'm the son of God, but I'm not, he never says I'm God. It's very uh, peculiar. He uses a lot of interesting language. Um, in that span of time, even before then, my uh, marriage had then fallen apart. Um, but even before my marriage fell apart, due to, um, I guess she wanted to see other people, forgot to tell me. I'll leave it at that, um, because you know I don't want to. I don't want to go there. Uh, I was heartbroken over the whole situation. It took. I was hospitalized for from the stress from that. Um, so I won't go back in there. Um, just know it's not around anymore. But I even remember at the time when I was married, discussing with my uh, wife at the time. I was very interested in Judaism, and I was asking her if we can convert to Judaism and she said absolutely not no I don't have a need to convert I'm already Israel no man no rabbi is going to tell me that I'm Israel um, and I thought I just left it at that at the time because you know you have to have uh, at, from what I was reading especially from the uh, the garden of peace uh, the the different uh, Shalom Arush books is that you don't you want uh, Shalom Bait, Shalom Base. And even though uh, I disagreed with her on a lot of things, I respected that. I go, as long as, okay, I can't convert because my wife doesn't want to convert. And then my marriage fell apart. And I was, I remember the day it happened and I was so heartbroken and crying and, and I went to my father and I remember him restoring this confidence in me of this is your chance to be the person that you always wanted to be. This is your chance to do the things that you wanted to do. And in that moment, he was saying, you should consider converting. And because he knew that I had wanted to, but he knew that I couldn't because my wife didn't want to at the time. But at the time, then she was out of the picture. And that, that was like only hours out of the picture, and he was trying to comfort me. He was trying, I, I don't know if he really thought he's going to do it if I say this. And he was saying, he was even saying things that my mom was saying, oh, well, uh, don't tell him that. He might actually do it. Um, but he was saying, you should convert. You should, you know, maybe spend some time in Israel. Do some things. Find yourself. And uh, at that time, I uh, I still hadn't completely abandoned the idea of Yeshua not being the Messiah. But I had abandoned the idea of blindly believing that he is based on things that weren't to be fulfilled and I started studying more in that and I came to these messianic prophecies some of were, which weren't messianic prophecies at all when you read them in context um, like things that were talking about um, actually talking about uh, Hezekiah things that were actually talking about um, other people in the Bible and it didn't have anything to do with Messiah even 
not even uh, Orthodox Judaism referred to these things as Messianic prophecies, yet they were used by the Christian Church as Messianic prophecies uh, and completely taken out of context. And when you start to read the Bible with the idea in your mind that Yeshua is Messiah, you're looking for places where you can stick him or where he comes out. And if you read those places in context, a lot of the time, uh, he you won't find him. And that's just my opinion. You can choose to disagree with me or whatever. Um, but over time, I uh, I wanted to convert. Like after that, I because shortly after that, actually, the next day after my I had found out things about my marriage that shattered me. Um, the very next morning, my um, that evening I went. It was a Friday, and I went to my parents' house, and my dad said, "You don't need. You should not be alone this Shabbat." you need to be with your people. And I don't know what he meant by that because some of the people at my congregation that I went to at that time were closely related to my wife at that time. And I didn't really want to show up and face them. But I don't think they expected me to show up that day. I think they expected me to stay home and cry, which I did a lot of. Um, but he said, you don't need, you need to be with your people. And I remember um, meeting up with a, uh, a Jewish guy in Tulsa who uh, who mistook me and my then father-in-law for Orthodox Jews and told us that we need to move to Israel and what are we doing and what are you waiting on and he belonged to a local synagogue and he's a very eccentric character and I love him very much like a brother but I hadn't really talked with him much and I called him up and, and asked him well my dad says that I need to be somewhere for Shabbat with people that keep Shabbat but aren't necessarily involved in my current situation and he goes, it sounds like our synagogue, the one you've never been to before. So I went to the local synagogue for the first time ever. I had never set foot in that synagogue before. Um, and it was within walking distance of my house at the time. Um, I prayed with them. I was, I shared Kiddush with them. At, at Kiddush, I, every, nobody noticed. They didn't um, recognize me, so they knew I was somebody new. So many people were approaching me, asking me all these questions. Where have you been? They were asking me where I've been, where like I've been there before. But they're going, why didn't you, haven't you been here before? Uh, you've lived in Tulsa all this time. We've never seen you. And knowing nothing about me um, except for a couple of them did find out what had just recently transpired they completely surrounded me and embraced me that afternoon I went to my buddy's house for Shabbat lunch and there was a very interesting character there as well a guy who had grown up uh, I think Hasidic or Orthodox for sure who was no longer um, as orthodox as his upbringing, but he still believed um, that he that the Jewish people were a, a, a chosen people and that it was very important to go to synagogue and to raise your kids Jewish and things like that if you're Jewish. And I remember I, ex I expressed to him that I did want to be Jewish. And he was, I think he was just trying to make me feel better. And he goes, well, do you want to become Jewish? You can become Jewish right now. You're circumcised, right? And I'm like, well, yeah, right. I was, I was from when I was a baby. And he's like, okay. Well, all you got to do now is um, say the, you have to say to me, um, or, or you have to say, he said, have you said, um, have you read Ruth to somebody where he says, my people will be, your, your people will be my people and my God will be your God. I will go where you go. You know, I will die where you die. I go, yeah, I've said that before. And he said, have you ever said it to a Jew? And I said, no, I've never said it to a Jew. And he goes, well, then it's no good if you have never said it to a Jew because Ruth said it to a Jew. How are you going to say my people will be your people and your God will be my God if you've never said it to a Jew? Because you're talking to people, to, you're talking to true, you know, whatever. So he pulled out a Hebrew Tanakh, uh, and I, he, my Hebrew was terrible at that time, and he goes, and you have to say it in Hebrew. So he fed me the lines one by one and said it to, I said it to him, and, uh, and he 
immediately he goes, welcome home. Welcome to the Jewish people. You're home. Which I kind of knew at that point in time, like, no, I'm not really Jewish. It's, it it's a, takes a little more than that, but it made me feel better. It made me feel like I belonged somewhere and there was a, a community that was going to embrace, embrace me and there wasn't going to be any drama involved. Um, so I did feel warm and fuzzy in that respect. And we continued to eat Shabbat luncheon and I went home afterwards and and I was just I was just thinking what the heck happened I don't even know what happened um, shortly after that I did decide to officially convert and I talked to a number of people that I knew within Judaism and uh, I was pointed to a um, a very specific rabbi who I will also not name um, if you want more information you have to talk to me personally this is just a very out there video it's not it's not naming names video but uh, this rabbi was he was an orthodox rabbi and he understood the heart of the searching soul cuz um though he came from an orthodox family there was a time when he was an orthodox and he uh, he was about to shuva and he became a rabbi again and he had that unique perspective of the searching soul coming back and so i that's i felt like i was coming home just by the way he would treat me uh he was probably one of the most patient people I've ever met. I had a lot of questions. Um, I already knew a lot of things, but learned more that I didn't know nearly as much as I did. Um, his organization, his the people he has working with him are uh, top notch in the respect of helping Jews or searching souls, people that were, their souls were at Sinai when the Torah was given. Maybe their flesh wasn't. But these are people that have always had Jewish souls, that have always been B'nai Yisrael, and felt out of place everywhere else they went. They specialize in helping those people find their way back home now it doesn't mean he spoon feeds it to you and Judaism should not ever spoon feed Torah I mean make Torah learning easy but it is better to have a sincere convert to Judaism than a half-hearted convert to Judaism who is going to uh, forsake their what they're taking on because when you become Jewish, you take on all the commandments of God. And not only that, people think that when you convert to Judaism, you're converting to another religion. That's not true. It's part of it. It's a very small part of it. You're really also becoming a part of a nation. You're becoming a part of a people. And you're forsaking, not forsaking, but you are casting off your old self, your old searching self, which... Jews still search, but it is a homecoming, and uh, it's nothing to be entered into lightly. In fact, uh, at that time I had started seeing, or there was a young woman who was a part of one of the congregate, the Messianic congregations that I had been a part of. Uh, following my divorce, I. Uh, we waited a while, and then I started talking to her again, and we became more interested in each other. And I, I remember I had that bomb to drop on her, that um, I go, you know, I don't think that Yeshua is who I thought he was before. I don't really have a problem with the guy, um, but I just haven't seen enough evidence if, based on the Bible to believe that who's he's who you know the Christians think he is. And I thought that was going to be a devastating blow. And she said, I don't either. And neither does my family. And uh, um, when that happened too, 
and she felt like she was searching as well that we approached the the rabbi together at about the same time about conversion um and at first he wasn't really thrilled about the concept of people that were dating or even courting not married going through a conversion together because that's that's very serious um i talked to him more about it she talked to him and eventually he goes well now i see that uh what what you actually mean that you're going to go about this the right way he goes i'm trust i'm get, putting a lot of trust in you that you're going to go about this the right way and uh so we went through conversion together um it was a lot of hard work a whole lot of studying a whole lot of self searching but also nation searching you're learning who these people are that you're joining what they've been through um, knowing that if you become a part of these people you will also take on everything the persecution the I mean all of the, the terrible things that have happened to the Jews um, for thousands of years and knowing that if something happens again just like you know the Crusades the the pogroms the Holocaust you're throwing your lot in with the Jewish people as well um, and that's a heavy thing to take on and he wanted us to know that that's something you're taking on to take it very seriously and we took it on um, we went through conversions we went through uh, the bait den which actually the bait den which is the 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 judicial body of <laughs> of rabbis that um, decide basically whether or not you go on to become a Jew and um, that was probably one of the most intense things I've ever gone through in my life one of the most serious shaking things ever I've had a I've been through divorce, I've been through friends dying, I've been through um, loss, I've been through a lot of things, and they're hard, but you get better from them. You, um, you, they, they thrust you forward into a new part of life, and uh, but going through the bait then, and you're asked questions, the heaviest questions that you'll ever be asked in your life. And these questions are unique to the individual. They are uh, many times very custom tailored to your backstory, but they're also very general questions that every person who is going under conversion should be asked. Um, and it's not really for the rabbis to know. Um, they're not always asking so that they have the knowledge about you. They're asking so that, it, and a lot of the time it's something you've never even thought of. You haven't thought about it. Um, and it forces you in that moment to really understand the weight of what you're taking on, the severity of becoming a part of the Jewish people. Um, and it, then that's scary because then you only have a, a limited amount of time before the, the answer. Uh, I don't know. So I hope that this kind of uh, thing, this video has been kind of helpful for people that are searching if you have any questions about um, Judaism well if you have any questions about the spiritual journey of somebody going through conversion or something like that don't hesitate to message me or anything like that um, or write me or call me or, or something like that I'm I'm very open to hearing what people have to say and answering questions um, but I do hope that that is somewhat helpful and that you kind of get a perspective when people ask me um, how long did it take you to you for you to complete your conversion um, even though the coursework for it was uh, there was from from deciding that you want to convert to Judaism to being a Jew that's not that shouldn't count that is not part of the process really I mean it's a process of really really getting to the nitty-gritty of living a Jewish life day in day out but I'll tell people it took about seven years 
from going from one faith to another faith to being or another nation to become from from going from Christianity that I was raised in to becoming a full-blown Jew and a part of the Jewish people um, so it's not a quick thing it should never be taken lightly it should take years to do um, but it's good for you to take that long so I hope this has been helpful for everybody and I wish you many blessings and don't hesitate to hit me up if you have questions Shalom <laughs>